morning glory Say there, stop that yawning A brand new day is dawning Pull up the shade and let the sun come through Good morning glory Spend about an hour Underneath a shower And keep on singing like the birdies do It is that time again Time for uh, Books of the Week When the New York Literati uh, Exchanges emails that read like this I almost wish there were no books because then there'd be no books of the week. <laughs> and here's Steve Donahue. I am in Wisconsin. And Steve, <laughs> Steve is in Boston. <laughs> That's about the best I can do here. <laughs> so there we are. Yeah, Good morning, hello, sir. everyone. Hello. <laughs> that still is from uh, the great Casey Affleck doing simple anthropological <laughs> mimeograph of a typical Dunkin' Donuts customer. He wasn't exaggerating at all in that bit. He's just doing what they do. <laughs> in your neighborhood. In your that's a that's a Dunkin, that's a very specific type of Duncan. Yes. Yeah. In my neighborhood is putting it lightly. I could <laughs> if I picked up a book, I could I could hit the Dunkin' Donuts that's nearest to me. <laughs> well please don't. I love that. And I was there this morning. Oh nice. Lovely. Fantastic. That's great. Well, this is a show for those of you who've never watched it before. I'm sorry. <laughs> you yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was like we were saying before we started filming. For those of you who have never watched before, wait, wait, we can explain. <laughs> <laughs> we ought to preface every show that way. <laughs> if you like Darth Vader, we have you now. Um, we're glad you're here. What we do here is uh, saunter through a library or bookstore with a, a king book critic, <laughs> royalty. How's Not like New, New York Literati. I have never actually published for a New York publication, but I've published for almost everybody else. <laughs> ah, by and large, I would say so. And uh, while you and I breathe and drink water, Steve reads. <laughs> so that's how it goes. We are look at a, uh, let me get the order right, a nonfiction title, then a fiction title of Steve's choice. And then as I walked through the library this morning, I grabbed six random titles and steve has no idea what i grabbed so it's kind of uh kind of the gong show <laughs> yes although i think you cedarburg public library patrons would agree it's a significant improvement from him walking through the library and grabbing six random pages <laughs> i'm not allowed to do that anymore no it's not allowed to do that anymore it's just these weird rules <laughs> i got in so much trouble for that it's unbelievable <laughs> anyway steve why don't you uh roll out your oh i'm sorry one example of the trouble was a marriage, wasn't it? <laughs> this is the worst kind. You don't never know what kind of danger you're going to get into when you start grabbing random people. <laughs> I grabbed and she said yes, of all things. <laughs> so it was very odd. Uh, Steve, why don't you roll out before we get in real trouble? Uh, why don't you roll out your nonfiction selection? It's at moments week? like this. I'm glad nobody watches this show. <laughs> <laughs> wait wait we can explain <laughs> hey don't me get out don't make me get out the big guns all right because <laughs> i will <laughs> so what you got there in your well, uh, trouble our sausage cannons have gotten us into <laughs> uh, for nonfiction this time around i have a horror story <laughs> okay the author is caleb carr yeah. A lot of you will know he had a best-selling book. And uh, for a relative rarity for a best-selling book, something that lodged with the New York Times bestseller list, something that everybody read, his book, The Alienist, was actually really good. Yes. Uh, except for the ending. Of course, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't have – it collapses completely in the ending into the black hole singularity into which all contemporary fiction collapses, <laughs> uh, as we're going to see. Little bit of foreshadowing. Oh, there. <laughs> and then he did a sequel, yeah, uh, to The Alienist, The, the Angel of Darkness, Angel that Darkness. was also really, really good, yeah. except for the ending, <laughs> uh, in which I think the serial killer, the intrepid detective, and Clarence Darrow all have a 50 page conversation in a bathtub. <laughs> uh, they all blur together. I'm not sure that that's remember. what I was hoping for when I read that book. I mean, it might have just been me. <laughs> and he's done lots of other things. A sci fi book, didn't he? I didn't read it, but I know there's a sci fi book. Yeah. They, the thing about them is they've all been great. It's a little bit unfair with, with people who break out the way he did with the alienist. Often that overshadows their career, and often that's unfair. Yeah. And in his case, it definitely is because he's never written anything that isn't worth reading. Very much worth reading, yeah. including 
this new book, which is called My Beloved Monster, and which is a nonfiction prose poem hymn of praise to a five foot tall monstrous cat. <laughs> This book was telegraphed for Steve Donahue, I think. Yeah. <laughs> he he adopted a cat named Masha. Mm -hmm. and this is basically the story of uh, that cat's life with him. Sure. Mm -hmm. And terrorizing their neighborhood and ruling their household. The the subtitle material goes into the regular, the, the well-known cliche about how I rescued this animal, but they really rescued me. Right, right. Yep. Uh, and oh, this gall, it just burns every <laughs> inch. This is also a wonderful book. <laughs> Steve likes a cat book. Steve likes a cat. I know. <laughs> but this isn't the first time either. May Sarton wrote a book called The Fur Person that was also a cat book and that was really good. Yep, yep. Dewey the Library Cat gets prayed around here quite a bit. The uh, book of, you know. <laughs> Some of our viewers may be wondering why I sound so, you know, kid sent off to school, why I'm dragging my heels. <laughs> Can I clarify why? I think you should. But well, before you do that, I, I should show you a recent picture. You should be careful. I should show you a recent picture. <laughs> oh. <in> my <laughs> so proceed with caution, Bob. Is that a Siamese cat? Yes, sir. You know, one of the funny things, one of the many funny things I see in cat people mm. is when Siamese owners say, oh, yeah, they're the crazy ones, as <laughs> if that distinguishes them from all the other cats in the world. It's just for yeah, color. It's like a killer whale and saying, oh, yeah, they're the streamlined ones. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, book culture and I'm sure you know this already, book culture and cats do seem to kind of gel. You're the outlier here, sir, <laughs> Mr. Dog. Oh, yes. Cats and book culture go way, way back, way, way back. And we're talking a lot further back even than the Quran, <laughs> yeah. where, it, where it's it's immortalized that, that Muhammad was an extremely affectionate cat owner and that his cats used to interrupt his reading and his writing. They'll do Neither that. Neither he could do. Uh, but we won't get into that. It's not a religious broadcast. <laughs> Long before that, though, cats are wandering into people's studies and doing all the things that cat owners love them for. Savagely scratching you, completely ignoring you. Uh, I got one. I, I probably won't show up on camera. That was yeah. <laughs> Oh, look what little Mitzi did to me last night. Uh, the first time I saw that happen in a workplace, I thought, there's something wrong with you people. <laughs> there, there is. There is. Yes. And that conviction about cat people has only strengthened over time. It's getting weird out there. Since the pandemic, since the Zoom era, the video conference era, we have all now seen a cat's anus. <laughs> because you put them in directly in front of the camera. They don't put their face in front of the camera or a paw in front of the camera. They hop up onto the table, walk until they're in position, and then show you that half torpedo tubes. <laughs> and as if that weren't all bad enough, when a cat isn't feeling like savagely clawing you or haughtily ignoring you, it will sometimes hop up on your chest, stare meaningfully into your face, and throw up on you. <laughs> it's very cold in Wisconsin winters. It's a quick way to warm up, Steve. <laughs> I have never in my life understood the appeal of these condescending, obviously French monsters as far as personal pets go. I have never understood the appeal. <laughs> We're talking about a kind of animal that once it extends its claws is not even physically able to retract them. <laughs> they have to retract on their own. A cat cannot decide to show mercy. You must have met one that was slightly endearing. You said that one is okay. I, I've met some who thrust themselves upon me, but it's not <laughs> endearing. No, how can it be endearing if you never want to know when the thing's going to go off like a howitzer shell? I especially love well, all the idiosyncrasies of cat people, the sharing of the scars. <laughs> the scars. The ritual. Another, another cat person ritual. That another, and also, I've heard Siamese owners say, oh, yeah, they're the crazy ones. Like that distinguishes them. But also another one is that you go to a cat person's home and sometimes they will endearingly say, oh, my cats think they're dogs. You'll know no one knows the difference. 
Oh, 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 Mitzi, where are you? Oh, where are you? She's going to come right up to you. She thinks she's a dog. And then we, we're looking for Mitzi. We get into the kitchen, and she's perched on top of the refrigerator, staring at me with death in her eyes. When's the last time a dog did that? You know, it's amazing, too, is that cats always know who the cat loather, who cat haters are. They go right to them immediately. It's fun to watch. <laughs> so, so we should, here I am uh, redirecting. We, we, the diet tribe is in. We got it locked in. And you, uh, the book sounds great. You love the it, book. It is really, really good. I, it's really, really good. And there are little children in sub-Saharan Africa who keep five-foot-long earthworms as pets. They drape them around their necks. And one of them grows up and goes to a whole bunch of coke-snorting Ivy League schools and becomes a great writer and writes a book about his beloved pet earthworm that's five feet long and has audible suckers i will be as mystified by that book as i am by this one that's the blurb <laughs> <laughs> we just found it um yeah and mr Carr's kind of doing the rounds he's actually getting some good press for this and it seems to be uh people are quite interested so um so yeah, I mean it's. Uh, I think they'll. I think he'll do well. Uh, apparently, his publisher was waiting for uh, book three of his uh, Alienist series, and he said, "Oh, here, here's my cat book instead." <laughs> so he mentioned that on the CBS Morning Show this weekend. So fascinating, good stuff. So all right, uh, a rave review measured <laughs> because of the subject matter of Caleb Carr. Let's move on over to fiction. What you got? Yes. I hope there's a cat. In this, I hope there's a cat in this book too, because that was fun. <laughs> We're, we're dealing with my favorite terrible thing, a novel, a kind of police procedural thriller by Madeline mm -hmm. Henry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a very striking cover. And as you start to read it, it's very, very engaging. It's about a detective named Nina Travers, who is investigating the disappearance of a best-selling novelist, a novelist named Claire Ross, who wrote a big breakout book, uh, the kind of quasi gone with the wind romance book that is not just for romance readers. Everyone is reading it. Everyone knows it. And she has disappeared from her well-heeled East Hamptons uh, home. Yeah. And Nita Travers gets the case and is right away a fascinating detective focus as a character. She's a chameleon. Mm-hmm. And we see this a lot in detective fiction, where, where the detective is the opposite of someone like Sherlock Holmes or, or Akou Perot, who are known for their eccentricities. Yeah, Instead, yeah. you get some characters that just they just blend into the woodwork. Uh, they blend into whatever they're, the person they're interviewing expects to see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when it's done well, and in the first half of this book it's done really well, we see yeah. that this gets Nina Travers' results. Yeah, If you're part of the furniture, you're going to get stuff out of suspects or witnesses that a more flamboyant character would not get out of them. I'm surprised we don't see more of this in detective fiction, just because it really is a fascinating trope. Uh, but the, usually the detectives are, you know, monk or, uh, you know, that, that type of quirky guy who enters yeah. the room, yeah. you know, and that's Which not is, as... Yeah. Isn't, it isn't the way in real life. It isn't yeah. the way in real life at all. We're, in real life, we're we're conditioned by uh, by law and order type shows, mm -hmm. where like in Homicide, where the the confession box is where the hyper charismatic detective it very flamboyantly gets a confession out of, breaks them down, makes them scream. Right, 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 that's right. not how actual right, detectives right. do it. Actual right. detectives do it much closer to the Travers, where mm -hmm. they just sort of let you convict yourself. Yes. There's a skill involved in that, a great deal of skill involved in that, but Absolutely. it's not a flamboyant skill. Yeah. And she, Nina Travers, starts to wallpaper herself onto the world of the Hamptons and eventually, even by inference, onto the world of Claire Ross. And so for the first 150 pages, you've got this wonderful, textured, smartly done police procedural thriller. Sure. Is it told from her perspective? Is it like a first? Well, no, not exactly. No. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it's a, a little bit. It's very that part of it for the first hundred fifty pages is intelligently done. Mm. The perspectives are very well managed, and then at around one hundred fifty, one hundred seventy, 
the sausage cannon goes off. <laughs> Kaboom! <laughs> okay. It doesn't happen all at once, but it is faster than just overnight. It it suddenly, I I, I think I'm justified in saying suddenly. Suddenly, uh, amidships, the book starts to change. Uh, it changes its tone. It changes some of the things that it's trying to sell the reader. And let's not have any naive listeners out there thinking that books aren't trying to sell anything to the reader. Every book is always trying to sell something to the reader. Police procedural is very much included. Usually the thing that the police procedural will be trying to sell to the reader is the belief that order rules the universe. Mm -hmm. When if if there's anything that this show disproves, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's that order rules the universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's the Brock Queen who rules the universe. <laughs> oh, you had to say it. Uh, you had to say it. <laughs> She's always in the wings. Ready so to I want to warn out. readers here that they're, they're going, readers are going to enjoy this book up until a point. And then it's suddenly going to ask you whether or not you want to continue. Mm. which you know a really smoothly constructed thriller will not ask you that question in fact it will remove even the possibility you will be along for the ride and that's that absolutely page turner this is one yeah. page turner right like yeah. the, the quintessential example would be thomas's harris thomas harris's novel red dragon right where you can't stop once you keep reading you it's not ever going to make any dis, any requests of you yeah. and this one does and I'm 100% sure in in long ago era, before social media, before the 21st century, I would have said, well, this is obviously a conscious choice on the part of the author. And I would have dug into it to figure out why that is. That's kind of sure. my job. But in the okay. 21st century, it could just be ineptitude. It could easily be ineptitude. In fact, yeah. in the 21st century, it could be that the first 160 pages that are totally cohesive and well written and well put together and well orchestrated are the only part of the book that was written by Madeline Henry. Oh no. So, oh man. Right. Easy through. But she just showed up and said, I've got the beginnings of a book here and I really don't effing feel like finishing it. And if you make me do that, I'll have my parents sue you or I'll sue you myself. Or, or, does or this go on? Like that. Does this okay. actually go on? I didn't even think that was a possibility, but is this... In the 21st century, there has to be a reason why absolutely no book of fiction has an ending anymore. There has to be a reason for that. I'm sorry if that makes me simplistic, but there has to be a reason for that. In the 20th century, that was not true. Right. In the 21st century, it is. The book, the, the author just wanders off. Sure, they don't sure. finish their book. Or there's a gigantic shift in tone and in what the book is trying to sell you. That happens here. I'm not yeah. saying that what happens after that shift is bad. But oh. you, it is different and it is coming. And I know some readers out there, including I bet a lot of our patrons, are the type of reader who uh, will want to know this because once they're invested in a book, they're not going to drop it, even if it becomes unpleasant. No, 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 no. The, there the are many readers who are like... Yeah, the concept of DNF doesn't seem to exist here in Cedarburg. I want to stress to the readers who are like that, you absolutely should teach yourself to do that. <laughs> you absolutely should. Uh, the, a book is uh, a coke-headed idiot spinning plates on poles. If you pay your two bits for that act, and 15 minutes into the act, all the plates fall, you don't stick around. Yeah, you don't, you don't stick around while the coke-headed idiot says, "Oh, I'm sorry about that. Ooh, ooh. How about if I juggle bits of oh, ooh?" Uh, you don't stick around. You leave yeah. if that happens. I want to stress that uh, you know you don't have all the time in the world to read. Right. right. The viewing of every episode of Books of the Week is shaving years off your life. <laughs> in so many ways, not just. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so many ways. You will sooner or later find yourself. <laughs> yes. After too many of those birthdays, you're going to find yourself face down in our signature cheese bathroom. No. And that's going to be it. That's I, lost be it. <laughs> I lost that picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> uh, well, this so is. I want to stress, you, if you get to a book that does that, you should drop it. Yeah. But 
I know plenty of readers don't do that, and you're going to hit that here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I used to have a 100-page uh, threshold. Uh, when I turned 50, I turned it into a 50-page threshold. <laughs> Because <laughs> I became very cognizant of the uh, the sands in the hourglass. So, yes. all right. Well, that's uh, well, also it, kind of a um, week when I don't pay seventy five dollars to somebody over at the Elkhorn Tavern to wipe you out. <laughs> Sooner or later, one of them is going to do it. So far, they just take the seventy five dollars and drink it. I just love the fact <laughs> that you said the word Elkhorn. Um... <laughs> Sooner or later, one of them is going to abstain and do a whack job in your driveway. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, be fifty pages. <laughs> <laughs> They'll just blame it on a book banner. <laughs> they don't even know. <laughs> so. Oh no, 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 no! If you end up whacked in your driveway, I am the absolute number one. <laughs> Make I no have mistake. Your life on air for years now. <laughs> a long time. Yeah, you don't get to be innocent if you do that. <laughs> I it's my, it's one of those detectives you were talking about. I yes. wonder. Yes. Um, exactly. I bet so, you're all. Uh, you have you ever threatened me? <laughs> I bet you're all wondering why I called you here today. Yes. Why do you have this VCR right here? <laughs> Folks, this is what goes on before the show, too. Um, anyway, hey, right. it's time to shift gears. All right, he look, he's, oh, I feel like uh, Mickey and he's Rocky. All right, come on, get in there, get in the ring. Let's go. Hit me with your wild cards. <laughs> All right. We're going to start, you know, actually, no, we're going to start a little lighter. Because um, we've been we've been sweating it out this episode. I love these books. I keep trying to buy them for my library. They don't go off. They don't fly off the shelves like I wish they would, but maybe we can help that. I love these Penzler mysteries. And this is the Golden Age Biblio mysteries. This is like crack cocaine to people like us. Yes. <laughs> I'm assuming yes. you've leafed through this. I, it is fantastic. One, uh, There are very few givens that you have anymore in the publishing world, and Otto Penzler is one of them. Yeah. If you see his name connected with an anthology of any kind, get it. Just get Simple. your wallet out. Just yeah. get it. Just, <laughs> yeah. it, it's not a, it, in plenty of other anthology editors, it's hit or miss. Yeah. They're going through their 15th divorce. They might put together a bad anthology with Otto Penzler. I have no many I have no idea what number divorce he's on, but his <laughs> anthologies are absolutely great. And this one is all book centered murder. Oh. The book and, that squealed by Cornell Woolrich. Come on. <laughs> some of them are, are kind of dumb. Oh, sure. And, and some of them are kind of predictable. Mm -hmm. And also some of them are predictable because after a while of reading Otto Penzler anthologies, you get to know what he likes. Yes. <laughs> but boy, oh boy, is he not lazy as an editor. Yeah. He gives you everything in addition to just slapping pages together. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's wonderful. If you're fun. a book reader, obviously you have to be a book reader in order to be a mystery fan. <laughs> you're going <laughs> to love this book. Just love it's it. It's a very smart, very smart move on his part. Um, all right, let's uh, light it up. I question the logic of this one, but I got prequel here. We haven't talked about Rachel Maddow on this show. What do you think of this this year book? It's doing well. It's uh, I'm that's that's why I haven't brought it into the studio because it's never in. It was in it's this doing well, I assume, because she's really popular. Her show, is really popular. yeah, absolutely, yeah. And for such a shall we say drenched in red area, I was actually surprised it's doing so yeah. well. So yeah, you want to know the secret why? I do. Oh, I go ahead. I have an idea, but go ahead. Why is because there is almost no area of the United States that is literally drenched in red. That scares little, them. Little secret that the that Republican scares Party, the hell out of them, Steve. Yeah, they don't want to even <laughs> think it. They certainly don't own anyone saying it. We just did. The, the key here isn't to go by polling. It's to get to see the country. I have seen the country. I have talked to thousands and thousands of people in every state. And if you ask those people, ordinary people, just ordinary Wisconsinites, if you ask them a, a questions on a host of absolutely woolly, blue state, ultra East Coast liberal questions, <laughs> you will get back woolly, blue state, ultra liberal East Coast answers. Even from him. <laughs> Even from him. Do, do, do any of these deep red states, are any of them full from stem to stern with people who hate trans people, who hate black people, who want to deprive women of, of their rights? No. 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 You no. would have to go a long way on a long country road to find even one person who thought that way. Well, that is true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> the deep red states are the products of voter suppression and gerrymandering. We're watching Arizona right now wring their hands quite a bit, aren't we? 
I wish that, that more Americans could feel comfortable with that. Yeah. You know, I wish they could feel more comfortable with that. Yeah. I, I realize there are a lot of horrible stereotypes associated with woolly East Coast liberals. And maybe you don't want to be them, or maybe there's a family tradition or something like that. But it's very uncomfortable to constantly posture in the opposite of the directions of what you actually feel. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't forget, folks, this is an East Coaster, too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the book, what do you, uh, did, I'm assuming you have uh, given this a look? Yes, I gave it a, I gave it a read. And yeah. it's, it's very good, whoever wrote it. Ah, we'll leave that one dangling. <laughs> let's uh, let's let the viewer uh, do that. Um, let's say I more believe that Masha the cat wrote it. <laughs> oh boy, Masha! <laughs> oh Masha! <laughs> the thing that bothers me about it is this presumption. This presumption that so many people have that writing books is a default. So if I only weren't busy doing X, I could sit back and yeah. write a book. Yeah. When <laughs> Rachel a has a job that keeps her busy 15 hours a day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the after, the, so this is an afterthought. The afterthought right. nature of these, I don't, yeah, I feel it same. It always way. drives me crazy when people say, oh, you know, if I only had some free time, I'd write a book. And I want to say to them, do you ever say if I only had some free time, I'd run a marathon? No, you don't. <laughs> no, no. Anyway. We, we, know sure what I, we know what I'm doing in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Steve, I have been curious about this book. I pass it on the way uh, to the different departments. And I don't even know much about the author, but he seems interesting. And I don't know if – and I, I – what did you think of this? And there's a book too yes. we have here too, and I want to look at it, but I'm not sure. This is Wolf Song, and I know what you mean. I know what you mean by just having <laughs> a big question mark over these things. I read the first one, and it was engagingly done, but it had signs all over it saying "Cult now recruiting." <laughs> That's, this is my this was my thought. <laughs> and now it's full blown. Now the new books have big signs on them saying "Get out." <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> you, you, the people on my sub sub Reddit, they get all the jokes I'm making here, and none of the rest of you do, and we don't want you. I'm 53. He doesn't want me. No, I guarantee you. No. <laughs> well, well my uh, my well, Siamese I'm... my Siamese cat probably discounts me anyway, so that's why. <laughs> oh, well, they tend to. Yeah, yes, I, 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 I noticed I haven't invited any of your parties lately. <laughs> they wine you and dine you. They take you to bookshops on the Rue de Rivoli, and then they disappear without even so much as a word. <laughs> they have they have other things to do. I've grabbed this book because I've been done. What other things do they have to do? They sleep twenty three hours a day. I've cleaned out their sandboxes. Let me tell you, they're busy. <laughs> when they're not sleeping, they are very methodically knocking objet d'art <laughs> off of shelves <laughs> one after another while looking not at the objects, but at you. They're looking at you. They know what they're doing. What's great is Steve is apolitical, except on this topic. <laughs> He's going to run on this platform, I think. <laughs> And get 49% of the vote. Or no, 51. I think they're uh, lapping uh, dogs right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just a little. But only through voter suppression and Jerry Bookery. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> You're going to storm uh, PetSmart. <laughs> Nothing happened. I don't know. <laughs> so I grabbed this book, number one, because it's a biography, and I know you're a fan. Also, because I've always wanted to say this in this voice on the air. <clears throat> Here we go. It's a big moment for me. <laughs> what have we here? <laughs> yes, this is Billy D. Williams' um, autobiography. I have not read it. No? Okay. Um, I, I am sure that Masha the Cat did a wonderful <laughs> job writing it, but I have, I have not read it. And I, I will get to it eventually. I'm worried about being disappointed. I want to be him. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> the standard reaction to Billy D. Williams is that everybody wants to be him. <laughs> but I worry that I always worry about things like this because a Billy, the thing we, that people tend to forget about Billy D. Williams is that he's really accomplished, has had a long career. Sure. He's encouraging you to forget that with 
the title and the cover photo. <laughs> yes, he wants I you to focus know. on one thing. <laughs> right, and I don't know. Is this going to be a Star Wars memoir? Nah. Is it be, uh, you know, a, an entertainment memoir? I don't know. I will get to it, but I haven't, I haven't got to it yet. I mean, nobody sports a cape. <laughs> Like Billy D sports no, a cape. Nobody does. <laughs> so no. there we are. No, he's widely regarded as one of the coolest human beings alive. I mean, I just haven't read the book. That's all. <laughs> we will both get to it at some point. Oh, I'm he sure. Have his own sign for his show. No. Anyway, uh, moving on. <laughs> um, as if I don't sweat enough during these <laughs> shows. Here's an author that I have a very strange relationship with. Not actually, just in the reading world. I I love the ideas of her books, but I don't. I've never liked the execution. And this is Connie Willis in The Road to Roswell. I love what she's doing. I just don't love how she does it. <sighs> is this any different? I, I hear that from some people. I worship her work. Do you? Okay. All right. So I'm not one of those people. I I thought this I thought this book was a little bit easy. It seems uh, as such. <laughs> but, and that it disappointed me in that way. And I only read I read the ebook. So mm. I didn't have a dust jacket or anything. And I'm yeah. afraid to know if she's like 95 years old or something like that. She's been around a while, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, she has been around for a long while. And she's written a lot of great stuff. If, yeah. if your your patrons. Maybe if you're not interested in this book, you might look up earlier work. Yes, and we have uh, quite a few actually. You have her uh, time, really? time travel. Oh yeah, her time travel uh, books and her yeah. We oh, actually, wow. for some reason our sci-fi section um, in the we must have had a buyer in the 80s and 90s and it, it flourished and they kind of held together because of course sci-fi is a very certain and particular patron. <laughs> So um, we always know them when they walk in. Your library didn't de-access them? No. We um, all hear nightmare stories about libraries de-accessing all kinds of things. Withdrawing uh, with a uh, machete. No. And in fact, now that I'm here, <clears throat> I'm the protector of the sci-fi section. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, some is gone. Some is very sad and gone. Um, they tried to walk the illustrated Dune to the dumpster two years ago, and I jumped on that grenade. <laughs> So it had a coffee stain. I'm like, that's charm. <laughs> and you're the one who got the hot dogs back in the vending machine. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I have very specific tasks here on my, on my 40 hours. Finally, we're going to wrap up with another biography because, again, I know you are a fan. This one is also sort of beguiling. I like the cover and I like the subject matter. This is Anna Mae Wong's, uh, uh, about her, uh, Daughter of the Dragon. Have you had a chance to look at this? Uh, the silent oh. film star? Yeah, it's it's something else. It, uh, I, I, it's on my it's on my pile. So um, is it a novel? It is not. It is a I, it is a biography. Uh, Anna, Anna Mae Wong's Rendezvous with American History: Daughter of the Dragon. So yeah, it's uh, a Hollywood. Uh, I suppose a bit of a tell-all set in the twenties uh, and thirties. I imagine since she was a uh, silent era. Um, star, uh, controversial, I guess, a little bit. Uh, brought a little sultriness to those uh, Nickelodeons <laughs> back in the day. So I guess I'll have something to withdraw from the library when I pay a visit. Uh oh, <laughs> you do have a card. <laughs> I believe I sent you one. Uh, yes, the library fines on the Donahue account are exorbitant. <laughs> Yes, he sent me a, a Cedarburg Public Library library card when we started Books of the Day back in the, in the golden era. And I thought it was meant as a kindly gesture. I've since realized that it was a preemptive apology. <laughs> <laughs> better than Hallmark. <laughs> yes, better than Hallmark. We don't make a Hallmark card for what we're doing to our no, listeners. No, <laughs> they wouldn't even. <laughs> it's, you know, birthday, bar mitzvah, tortured book critic. I'm not, it's just not in the, it's not on the row. <laughs> Well, that's a show for this uh, wonderful books of the week. Um, wow. Uh, if you're feline viewers, <laughs> send your letters whenever you like. Cat people, all that sort of thing. Um, and what's interesting is that this show, if you can believe it, is actually supported <laughs> by a groundswell of the friends of the Cedarburg Public Library who approve. Uh, or Oh, yes, Steve. One of whom will also sometimes jump on your chest and vomit in your face. <laughs> and it's not the one you think. <laughs> no, it's not. And may I add, frequently for good reason. Um... <laughs> well, I don't, you'd know better than I. You're the one who cleans out their boxes. <laughs> Thankless, thankless task. <laughs> thankless task. <laughs> I tell you what. Again, you know, 
Cedarburg Public Library Books of the Week is the quintessential thankless task. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It's, I, I have it that way since no one's ever thought to thank us. <laughs> <laughs> Comments down below. Gratitude. Just pour it on like like maple syrup. That's what we need. <laughs> All right. But that is a show. We are back next week with more wonderful stuff. I cannot thank you enough, Steve. I look forward to this. If you can I'm off to Duncan. All right. Okay. Say hi to my buddy. Right. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great reading week. Steve, have a have a triply great reading week. Take care. Bye-bye.